What's up everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Da Vinci Cases. Alright, so the way this works is we've got a clinical case followed by a board style question. So we're going to go through the question stem, point out the relevant clinical findings, take a look at the question and the answer choices, and then kind of divert for a minute and go through the relevant concepts to answering the question. Then we'll come back and apply those concepts that we went over to answering the question. So for this case, we've got a 37-year-old woman. She's presenting to the emergency department with chest pain. This chest pain began spontaneously earlier this morning while lying in bed. So she wasn't exerting herself. She was actually resting, resting in bed. She was either asleep or probably just waking up. The other thing here is that, you know, she's pretty young. Remember the age risk factor for cardiovascular disease in men is 55 and women at 65. So this is very young for a woman to have any underlying uh, significant cardiovascular disease. However, you still want to always consider that though when someone's coming in with chest pain. So the other things you want to worry about are, so obviously heart issues, lung issues, especially like a PE, something you could see in someone really of, in, at any age, especially in adulthood. Um, then the other thing is, is uh, mental health. So it could be panic disorder, anxiety disorder. So those are things you always want, also want to keep in mind as well. She's also been experiencing lightheadedness and diaphoresis. So she's lightheaded, she's sweating a lot. You know, that could be a number of things. It could be just being overwhelmed by the episode could be, you know, obviously more tied to the physiology if it's more like an MI or angina. Um, the patient rel relates that she's been experiencing similar spontaneous episodes of chest pain over the past month. So this isn't a one-time thing. This is an acute thing. It's been, you know, happening for a significant period of time now, about over the past month. These are spontaneous, so there's no obvious trigger to them. Um, she seems to just get them. And so it's not, you know, like she's getting them when she's exerting herself, like climbing stairs or running or anything like that. The other thing here it says is the episodes usually occur at night or early in the morning. So again, where she's usually resting. So she's, you know, either lying in bed or she's resting or sleeping. Um, so again, not with, with exertion. She has no significant past medical or family history and does not take any medications. So this is really significant because in someone this young, if you were worried about a cardiovascular problem, you would think, oh, maybe you know, they're a diabetic, maybe they've already got some hypertension, hyperlipidemia, she doesn't have any of that. The other thing in someone this young with a cardiac problem is you could be worried about an underlying family history. So some people have genetic conditions that can predispose them to earlier heart disease. She doesn't have any family history. The other thing is that can cause significant episodes of chest pain are, med are side effects to medications. She's not taking any medications, so you can rule that out as well. Um, onto the lifestyle component here, the patient consumes two alcoholic drinks per day. She also smokes one pack of cigarettes per day. So that's certainly a cardiovascular risk factor. So on the risk factor, she really the only ones are mainly the smoking and then a little, little bit of alcohol use as well. Physical exam, it doesn't reveal any abnormalities. So that decreases our suspicion, you know, maybe she had like an underlying uh, valve disorder or valve pathology. And so it tends to de decrease our suspicion a little bit because she doesn't have a murmur or any kind of abnormal sounds, that, such as you would hear with a valve or even with something like pericarditis, which you could also see in a younger person as well. They do an EKG in the ED and it reveals an ST segment elevation. Now this is very significant because ST segment elevation corresponds to transmural ischemia. And remember your layers of the heart. So you've got three layers of the heart, just like of the blood vessels. So you've got the endocardium, the myocardium, which is the muscle, and then you have the epicardium. Transmural ischemia corresponds to ischemia through all three of these layers. This is transmural ischemia versus subendocardial ischemia is just in this first layer here. So this is pretty significant. This often can correspond to a STEMI. ST elevation, myocardial infarction, very serious. The very next step in management is you got to get these patients to the cath lab, open up that block vessel. So that's what they did. They took the patient to the cardiac cath lab for a coronary angiography. However, what that revealed is that there's no evidence of coronary artery disease. So in the end, she's not having a myocardial infarction. There's no blockages. There's no underlying disease. And again, not surprising because she, we have a 37 year old woman here. She's younger. The only significant risk factor is cigarette smoking. No significant past medical history or family history. So before we move any forward here, let's just kind of summarize this interesting case here. 
So the key findings, again, we have a young adult woman. She has episodic chest pain occurring spontaneously. They usually occur at night and in the early morning, so at rest. You wouldn't call this exertional chest pain or exertional angina. There's no relevant past medical or family history. There's no current medications. She does drink a little bit, and then she smokes one pack per day, which is significant. She has a normal physical exam. EKG definitely has that ST segment elevation, which is very significant. But the big thing here at the end is that coronary hydrography reveals no evidence of coronary artery disease. And so that would decrease the chance that this is an MI. So again, the big things you'd be thinking about here are angina, which is episodes of chest pain, obviously MI, and then pulmonary embolism, especially these two because these can kill somebody. I think given by the, the cath, we can rule out an MI. Pulmonary embolism, you know, obviously you're going to have, a, you could have acute chest pain. Clinically, it's kind of a little more hazy. The other thing is she's having a, a history of this. She has history of these episodes. Pulmonary embolism, if it does have chest pain, is going to be more likely where it's going to be just an acute uh, presentation of chest pain, you know, because it's due to an embolus from, a, you know, a clot breaking off in a vein and traveling, uh, you know, up to the pulmonary circulation. What this sounds much more like is, is episodes of angina, which are, ch you know, chest pain. So given that we think it's angina, let's go through the three main types of angina and see if we can find the one that fits this patient best. So first, stable angina. So the pathology here, you have impaired coronary perfusion due to atherosclerosis. So let's draw a little bl a coronary blood vessel down here, a coronary artery. So you've got an atherosclerotic plaque forming it down here. Obviously, you know, a blood vessel is just a tube or a pipe, and so you're limiting blood flow through that to get to the tissue. And so by limiting that blood flow, that it's not a big deal at rest because you're not putting as much demand on the heart tissue. And so really what you see, though, is when you have exertion, when you're going to increase blood flow, you're going to have increased flow to the tissue because you have increased demand on the heart tissue. That's where you're going to see limiting the blood flow. And so you're going to have decreased perfusion, and that's where you're going to get chest pain with exertion. So that's the key thing here. It's stable because at rest you don't experience it. And so it's with exertion, with you know, physical activity. And then the other key thing here is that this pain is relieved with rest or nitroglycerin. And so the example here is you know someone exerts themselves, they start to feel chest pain, they stop and they take a rest and sit down and the chest pain goes away. And so that's, that would be an example of stable angina. On EKG, sometimes you can see ST segment depression on EKG and Histologically, that corresponds to subendocardial ischemia. So again, remember you have the three layers like this. You have the endocardium, the myocardium, and then the epicardium like this. Subendocardial ischemia is just going to be this first layer here, and that corresponds to ST segment depression on EKG. Unstable angina. So this is where you have incomplete coronary occlusion due to a thrombus. So let's again draw down here. You'll have a plaque like this. So what happens, let's say the plaque ruptures and you have break off of the plaque and then what you have is the clotting cascade comes in and forms a significant thrombus here. So you have a thrombus here and it keeps building up. But what you'll notice here is there's still a little opening here. You haven't completely occluded blood flow, so it's incomplete. And so what, what happens here is that since you've seriously occluded this vessel or, or cause a significant decrease in blood flow to the tissue, you're going to have chest pain at rest and with activity. So this is going to be chest pain that if you, you know, have it with activity, it's not going to be relieved with rest. And so you're going to, you know, this is someone who's, you know, they're sitting on their couch watching TV and they have, you know, an episode of serious chest pain. Um, that would be the difference. This, so that, that, that is the big difference between unstable and stable is that stable is relieved with rest versus unstable is where you see chest pain occur with at rest. And so that's a big difference there. You can also see ST segment depression on EKG with unstable. And then lastly here we have Prince metal angina. So this is due to coronary artery vasospasms. So if we draw a cross section of an artery here, and remember an artery has those three layers as well, the tunica intima, the tunica muscularis like this, which is the muscular layer. This would be the lumen in here, and then you have the tunica adventitia out here. Usually the muscularis layer is a lot thicker than this, but you get the idea. And remember that the, you know, it's just like any other muscle, it can contract, and what happens is it'll narrow the lumen, and so it'll decrease blood flow. And so if the muscle contracts and you have a narrowing of the lumen, you know, if it's much narrower here, 
due to muscular contraction, that's going to decrease blood flow. And so these are more spontaneous episodes. They often occur at night or in the morning, just like we see with our patient. And again, these are usually found in younger patients without cardiovascular risk factors. It's very commonly seen in patients who smoke cigarettes. And then it's also can be seen where it's triggered by smoking, alcohol, and even cocaine use as well. And so these things, you know, it's it, when I say triggers, they trigger the vasospasm. So they trigger contraction of this tunica muscularis layer within the coronary vessels, within the coronary arteries. And then that restricts blood flow, causes ischemia, and these patients then complain of chest pain. The other thing here is you'll see ST segment elevation on EKG in prinzmetal angina. And so again, we see that in our patient as well. Th what seems here is this seems like a nice fit for our patient. Seems most likely that they have prinzmetal angina. So if we come back to the answer choices here, let's go through them one by one. So complete thrombotic occlusion of the coronary artery. This is an MI, my myocardial infarction. Again, you know, you have that plaque like this. It ruptures, it breaks off. It comes in here, the clotting cascade causes a thrombus formation that completely occludes the vessel. And so you have complete lack of distal blood flow. That's a myocardial infarction. Coronary artery vasospasm. This is the exact pathogenesis of prinzmetal angina. So this is looking like our answer choice. Incomplete coronary occlusion due to a ruptured atherosclerotic plaque. This is unstable angina like we talked about. Again, you know, you have the plaque like this. It ruptures and goes downstream. You have clots that are formed, but you can still get some flow around it. And so this is unstable angina. And remember again, this is the angina that occurs while at rest. Subendocardial ischemia due to decreased coronary perfusion. This is stable angina. So again, you've got underlying disease. It's causing narrowing of the lumen. At rest, that's not a big deal, but when you have exertion, you increase demand on the heart, increase blood flow, and so and you're not able to you know, match that increased demand because you have a narrowing of the vessel, an underlying narrowing of the vessel here. And so this is um, angina that is relieved with rest. Remember, that's the big difference between stable and unstable angina. Generalized anxiety disorder. Remember with these mental health disorders, uh, they have very strict diagnostic criteria according to the DSM. They usually have a very strict time frame. And so here, again, excessive worrying. Excessive worrying would be beyond just, you know, everybody has their worries. This would be beyond what's normal. It's for at least six months. You know, this has only been occurring for the past month, these episodes. And the other thing here with to often form a mental health diagnosis is that whatever the symptoms are, they have to in interfere with the patient's social, emotional, and or professional function. So they're causing dysfunction with their family life or their relationships or their emotional well-being or their the ability for them to do their job or their profession. So you have to see this, you know, combination of things here. And so it doesn't seem likely that it's due to an anxiety disorder. So this is a patient with prinzmetal angina, which is due to coronary artery vasospasms. All right, that's all I have for you this week. Make sure you check back every Wednesday for new Da Vinci cases. In the meantime, subscribe to our channel for more videos. And then be sure to download the PDF notes for this video on our website at dviacademy.com. Also on our site, you can find our book and video packages for anatomy and biochemistry. All right, thanks for watching. We'll catch you next week.